Without donors like you. Like you. Please donate to the Reef Trauma Program. From me and Willow, please donate to Reef Drama. Please donate. Thank you so much for donating. Please donate to our drama department. Mama will be very displeased if you do not. Thank you. Thanks for donating. And now, please enjoy the importance of being earnest. Yay! Yay! and welcome to Reef Drama's production of Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. My name is Christine Sabina, and it's been my honor to direct this crazy journey over the past month. You know, it's been over a year since our students stepped foot on stage when we began this process. A year. And is it different? Yes. Has it taken a village of people doing jobs they've never done before? Yes. Are we all tired, nervous, and excited? Also yes. But with challenges come grit, love and focus and these students certainly have that <laughs> we could not be more proud of the love and the support that they have given each other these challenging times have tested them truly each day brings new unknowns but if you love what you do and you see a poignant value in working with others to tell a story then it all works out in the end please consider a donation of five dollars per viewer to support the growth of this amazing troupe their passion, smiles, and perseverance inspire us daily. Also, make sure to tune in to our spring musical, A Chorus Line, April 14th through 16th. Now, audiences may be small, who knows? But the love is tremendous. We love you, Troop 5744. And now, please enjoy the importance of being earnest. The making of the importance of being earnest. My name is Jack Schoenblatt and I'm playing the understudy for Jack. The audition process was really fun because I haven't been in an audition process for over a year and it was just really fun. It started off for me virtually but when I came back physically it was a really fun experience being with everyone. Addison Dora Stone and I play Gwendolyn in The Importance of Being Earnest. My favorite thing about playing my character is probably that I get to be comedic because I love playing comic relief characters. Shepard and 
I play understudy for Gwendolyn. Uh, I originally auditioned for Gwendolyn, but the person who plays Gwendolyn, Addison, she's such an amazing actress, and I'm so happy to be your understudy. The rehearsal process was kind of different in the show because some people would get quarantined and they would have to say their lines through Zoom instead of acting them out with us in real life. Hi, my name is Jose Samoza and I play Lady Bracknell. My favorite scene to film would be my scene where I go off on Jack and until I figure out that she's got money and then I'm like, oh, you know what, maybe you can marry her and I give her that whole lesson on how to be a more sophisticated lady. My name is Tony Santi, and I'm in The Importance of Being Earnest, and I'm going to be playing Chasuble. I definitely think I relate to Chasuble the most, because he's kind of like a, like a gullible idiot, almost, and that's also how I am in real life. Hi, I'm Brian, and I play the character of Jack. My experience working on the show has honestly been a whirlwind. It's been so fast, such a fast process, but it's been great like just being back in like a theater setting, doing a show, like working on a character with other people and like just reacting in person. Hi, I'm Nikki. Hi, I'm Maxie. And we're the prop crew. I think the show is really humorous and it's very artistic. There's a lot of different types of art styles in it and I think it's really enjoyable. Hi, I'm Angeline Serrano and I'm the charge artist. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun getting to know new freshmen especially, but it's been really, really stressful trying to get everything done. It's been great, uh, a lot of work definitely. I've never done this much work in a show, but really fun. <laughs> I didn't think stage managers did that much work, but they do. Currently we're trying to get all the walls real done, so I've been painting striped walls and all that good stuff. And then my next project is probably painting some more portraits, so that's what I'm on right now. Hi, I'm Anina Cueto and I'm on the costume crew. A lot of stuff that I didn't know that necessarily happened behind the scenes because I'm always usually on stage, so it's been really fun doing costume. So please enjoy the show. Please enjoy the show. Please enjoy the show. Please enjoy the show. And now, please enjoy the importance of being earnest. The audience has arrived, sir. <clears throat> the audience has arrived, sir. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Algernon Moncrief, for the moment, at any rate. And these are my battle quarters in London. The little drama you are about to witness happened one afternoon around tea time when... My dear Hendrix, what brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> that is my dear friend, Ernest the Worthy. <laughs> and what do you suppose I discovered? <laughs> that his name isn't Ernest at all, it's Jack. And from 
the inscription on his cigarette case, I also discovered that in his home in the country, he has a young and charming ward named Cecily, who addresses him as Uncle Jack. But why, my dear fellow, do you have one name in town and another in the country? My dear Archie, when one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone. It is one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce much for one's health or one's happiness, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest who lives in Albany and gets into the roughest of scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth. Pure and simple. I can understand this very well. Jack had invented a most useful younger brother named Ernest to come up to town as often as he liked. And I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid named Bumbery to come down to the country whenever I choose. Of course, the principal reason Jack or Ernest wants to come up to town is to flirt disgracefully with my cousin Gwendolyn. While I find Bumbery particularly helpful in breaking dinner engagements with Aunt Augusta. <laughs> Good afternoon, Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. Feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things really go together. Gwendolyn, won't you come and sit here? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. I was usually able to occupy Aunt Augusta upon one pretext or another so that my dear friend and his beloved Gwendolyn spent some time together. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you. Yes. Not only girl <laughs> I have ever met. Go on. Since uh, I met you. Yes, I'm quite aware of the fact. And for you, I have always had an irresistible fascination. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. <laughs> there is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest. <laughs> I knew I was destined to love you. But you don't really mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. This again. <laughs> yes, I know it is, but uh, personally, darling, I, I, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn. I think there's lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, I'm a charming name. Jack. No, there is very little music in the name Jack. If only at all, indeed. Oh, the only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get pressing at once. Uh, uh, uh. I mean, we must get married at once! Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You know that I love you. And you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Gregory, <gasps> will you marry me? <laughs> I'm afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. <laughs> oh, Mr. Worthing! Gwendolyn, you will wait for the devil hell in the carriage! Yes, Aunt Augusta was not at all inclined to consent to this engagement, but at least she was willing to consider him a suitor for her daughter's hand until she discovered that Jack had no idea who his parents were. <laughs> that he was indeed found in a classroom in a hard man in Victoria Station. You can hardly imagine that I, Lord Bracknell, would ever dream of a 
starving, our only daughter, to, to marry into a, a cloakroom and a an Elias with a handbag! Good morning, Mr. Webby. Ah, she is a monster! Without being a miss. Archie, you don't think there's any chance that Gwendolyn will become like her mother in about 150 years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, by the way, did you talk Gwendolyn about you being Jack in the country and Ernest in town? <laughs> My dear fellow, the truth is not the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to treat a woman. But, uh, what about your brother? The profligate, Ernest. Oh, I'll have disposed of him by the end of the week. Oh. I'll say he died. <laughs> In Paris! <laughs> I'm a severe chill! That gets rid of him! And that <laughs> is how our story began. I remember Jack had said that his ward Cecily was a little too interested in his brother Ernest. This interests me greatly. Jack had said that Cecily and I would never meet, but learning his country address was relatively simple for a confirmed bumperous. I had wisely saved one of my friend's town cards, Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany W. I expect it's going to be quite useful. Lay! Tomorrow I'm going bumbering. You may lay out my traveling clothes. Horrid political economy and horrid, horrid German! Oh, oh 
Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He's brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing? Before the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. Ask Mr. Worthing to come out here. I suppose you want to talk to the housekeeper about your room for him. Yes, miss. I've never met any truly really wicked person before. Dear brother, frightened. Pray, he would look just like everybody else. already. You are as lovely as a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think you should be saying those things to me. Miss Prism never said such things to me. Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the prettiest girl I've ever saw. Miss Prism says all good looks are a snare. A snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Please! I just got here! here. Come back, sister! Too much alone, dear Dr. Chelsea. You should get married. Well, I did find the walk quite pleasant. It was very enjoyable. Yes, it did quite well. Uh, Mr. Worthing! Uh, Mr. Worthing, this is indeed a surprise. We did not expect to be till Monday afternoon. I arrived a bit sooner than I expected. Dr. Chocible, I pray you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. Still in his life of pleasure. Dead! <gasps> Your brother Ernest. Ted? Quite dead. Oh, what a lesson for him. I shall see your prophet's eyes. Was, were you with him at the end? No! <gasps> He died abroad. In Paris, in fact. Oh. I received a telegram from the manager of the Grand Hotel last night. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe change. <laughs> you would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. But that reminds me, Dr. Chocobo, I assume you know how to christen. I mean, you are continually christening, I know. Is there any particular infant in whom you are interested in, Mr. Worthy? Your brother was unmarried, was he not? I'm not a dear doctor. The fact is, I myself would like to be christened. But surely you've been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. At uh, what hour was the ceremony performed? Oh, uh, I might trust around about five, if that suits you. Admirably, admirably. Uh, and now, no longer wishing to. <laughs> I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. No matter how badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. I'll go get him. I think you will not be returning to his loss. His sudden return seems to be particularly distressing. <laughs> Good heavens. Brother Jack! I've come to tell you that I'm very sorry for the life of you I've given you. And I intend to lead a better life in the future. Yes? You will not refuse your brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think it's coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. And Ernest has just been telling me about his poor infant friend, Mr. Burnley, whom he goes visit so often. Oh, he's been talking about Burnbury, has he? Well, I won't come talking to you about Bunbury, or about anything else for that matter. Oh, you're so dreadful. So I don't want to hear this right now. Oh, I'm trying to be happy. You will call it us. Oh, 
out to you, young scoundrel. You must stand out of here at once. I don't allow any vampire in here. Are you serious? I have put Mr. Ernestine's in the room next to you. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have put them in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three automatics, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week at this time. Mary, on the dog cart. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called down to town at all. Yeah, you have. And I hope you have a pleasant journey back to town. This bundering, as you call it, has not been a great success. I think it's been a very great success. I'm in love with Cecily. And that is everything. Oh, he's gone to send the dog cart for me. How is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. The dog cart is waiting, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope I shall not offend you, Cecily. I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be a personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does a great credit, Ernest. If you allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. No. Oh. Don't stop, Ernest. I delight taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. Are you ready for more? <coughs> of course, Ernest. I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily. Uh, ever since I've looked upon your wonderful and in, incomparable beauty, I dared to love you uh, wildly, passionately, devotedly. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week, around the same hour. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy! Of course! Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes. It will be exactly three months on Thursday. How did we become engaged? Well, ever since Uncle Jack first mentioned to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, became the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, but when was the engagement actually set? On the 4th of February last, worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I was determined to end the matter one way or another. So, after a long struggle with myself, I finally accepted you on this very love seat. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the bangle with the true lover's knot that I promise you always to wear. Did I get you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's my excuse for your leading such a bad life. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You must not laugh at me, darling, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. I pity any poor woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But my dear child, are you saying that you couldn't love me if my name was some other name? But what name? Why, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. Seriously, Cecily, if my name was Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I'm afraid I would not be able to give you my undivided attention. Cecily, your rugby here, I suppose, is thoroughly experienced in all the practices of all the rites and ceremonials of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Chosabon is a most learned man. I must see him on the most important christening, most important business. What an impetuous boy he is. I must 
and dip his proposal into my diary. And Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Ernest. Pray, ask the lady to come out here. We shall have tea. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon. Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women who is associated with after tax philanthropic work in London. Miss Fairfax. Sweet name. You are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also? Oh no, I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Indeed. Indeed. My guardian, with the help of this prison, has a task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes. I'm Mr. Worthing's boy. It is strange he never mentioned to me the idea of a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. <laughs> I am not sure, however, that the news inspires you with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecilia. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to say that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were. Well, just a little older than you appear to be. And not quite so very alluring in appearance. Ernest has a strong... I beg your pardon, Miss Fairfax. Mm. Did you say Ernest? Yes. No, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It's his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say that they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that accounts for it. <laughs> Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. It would have been terrible if any cloud were to come across a friendship like ours. <laughs> of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married! <laughs> It is certainly very curious, for hmm, he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. I am so sorry, Cecily, to disappoint you, but I am afraid I had the prior claim. It distresses me more than I can tell you, Gwendolyn. But I feel bad to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. Pretty little head. Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some kind of misconception, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman who is by your side at present is my Uncle Jack. I beg your pardon. This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh! <laughs> he is Ernest. My own love. A moment. May I ask, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens! Gwendolyn! Yes, Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there was some slight error, Miss Carvey. The gentleman who is now at your side is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? <laughs> Are you really called? Algernon. I cannot deny it. Is your name really Jack? I could deny it if I liked. Oh. But my, my 
name sat in me is Jack. I, it has been for years. Our gross deception has been practiced on the both of us. My poor, poor deception, my sweet rose, my delirium. Mr. Webbing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. No brother at all? None. <laughs> I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl to find herself in, is it? Hmm. Mr. Welling, I have something very particular to ask you. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer the following. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. Well, that certainly seems like a satisfactory explanation, does it not? <laughs> yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. But that does not take away from the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of great importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer me for pretending to have a brother? Well, you know, I, Well, I well, you know, was it in order that you might have the opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. The explanations certainly seem to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Wernings. <laughs> I'm even more content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes! I mean, no! Ah, true! I had forgotten. Which of us should tell them? Could we both not speak at the same time? <gasps> An excellent idea. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier! Oh, Christian, Christian names! Is that all? But we have to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing? Believe me, are you ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. I am. Darling, darling! <laughs> Gwendolyn! What does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. And I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn. Lady Bathroom. You want to be on the college, sir? And may I ask Mr. Worthing? Who is this young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding what seems to me a peculiar, unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my lord. I am engaged to be married, Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I think the preliminary inquiry on my part will not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected to any of the larger railway stations in London? Miss Cardew is the late granddaughter of Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, oh, oh. and the Five Shire. Oh, and oh. oh! That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three hours of this air haze inspire confidence, even in treatment. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I have got to ask you, does this car do you have any little fortune? Oh, only about £130,000, that's all. It's lovely to have seen you, Lady Bracknell. Please, how pleasant day. Oh, am I, Mr. Worthing? £130,000? Why? Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady, now that I look at her. You girls of the present day have any really solid qualities, any of the qualities that last in a group of time. Come here. Hmm. Pretty child, your dress is certainly simple, and your hair seems almost as nature has left it, but we can see naught of that. 
Turn around kindly, sweet child. No, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Uh, yes, style depends on how the chin is worn. They're worn very high, just as present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta? I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily? You may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. <laughs> the marriage, I think, has been to pay quite soon. I hate to interrupt you, Lady Bracknell, but this marriage is simply out of the question. Out of the question? I am Cecily's guardian and she cannot get married without my consent. That consent I absolutely refuse to give. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the decision is entirely in your hands. The moment you consent to my engagement with Gwendolyn, I will gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is simply out of the question. <laughs> Come here. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Isn't that so much premature? I think that as things are now not as possible, it won't do either of us any good. I'm saddened to hear that, Mr. Worthing, but as your current mood seems particularly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed that... Miss Prism, Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Uh, Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention her? Miss Prism? Yes, my lady, I'm on my way to join her. Pray, allow me to detain you for a moment. Is this Miss Prism you mention? A female of repellent aspect of more than revolting sentimentality? She is the most cultivated of ladies in the very picture of respectability. Obviously, the same person. She approaches. She is not. I was terribly expecting you to get candy. I've been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Yo! Prism! Come here, Prism! Where is that baby? Baby! Eight years ago, you left Lord Bracknell's house in charge of a free ambulator that could take the baby of the male. But you never returned. Oh, when when you you a few weeks later, through the Metropolitan Police, the free ambulator was found in a remote corner at Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. What? Miss Prism, where is that baby? Miss Prism, explain yourself, please. Well, hurry up. Lady Bracknell, I do not know. <laughs> 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 I do not deny that is a 
masculine flow. But who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Mother, I forgive you! <laughs> I'm afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Miss Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. <laughs> Algernon's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all! Are you wrong? I said I had a brother! I was you I had a brother! <laughs> How could you not have believed that I had a brother? Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother! Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Out of you ought to treat me with more respect in the future. You have not treated me like a brother a day in your life. I'm telling me to for him. I've been out of practice. <laughs> my own. <laughs> what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Good heavens, I've quite forgotten that point. Auntie Basta, what name have I given? Well, being the eldest son, you are naturally christened after your father. Well, yes, but what was my father's name? I cannot at the moment recall the general's name, but I have no doubt he had one. I suppose his name would appear in the army list of the period, correct? The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life, but... I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. And generals. Malin, Magsbold, Magley. Oh, what ghastly names they have. Yes, quite could you discuss Markby, Migsby, Mobbs. Margrave! <laughs> Lieutenant 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General 1869. Christian names. Ernest John! Forgive me. I can, for I feel you are sure to change. My own one. Cecily, I'm lost. Letitia. Did you get a last? My nephew, you seem to be showing signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, for the first time in my life, I finally understand the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs> <laughs> Say something funny in a British accent. I would like some nutter butter, por favor. What's your favorite part of the show? Acquaintance, would you like to answer first? <laughs> My favorite part of the show was act one. Well, that's the only act I'm in. 
Though I will not attempt to do uh, an accent because my accent sucks. I don't. I'm not saying. I'm not being biased because he's my friend who was in Act One. But I thought that it was a really funny scene uh, with both characters. The interaction between both characters was really. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. I mean, it was Eddie. <laughs> no, I would say my character is really cocky and uh, you know just there for fun and you know uses people for things and you know isn't the best role model and I have no way to relate to any of those things at all. Next question. Who did you originally audition? <laughs> we were so close. No, no, keep it, keep it rolling, keep it rolling. <laughs> so this is a green wall. This is another green wall. This is my house. That's a painting. Then this is um this is part of my house. And then this is the backstage. This is the backstage area. Yeah, hey squad. So then this is this is my book. This is my book. But the thing is that the rest of these books aren't even real books. So it's like, well, no, 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 my hair is not gelled. Is that like an issue? Part of the show, watch people come watch it. Wait, do I say this in my character? But then you're asking what my favorite part of the show is as a character. Like, okay. I, like, I don't know. Oh. Here, say something. Hi! Oh, like, do I say something of like value? No. No, what, what's poppin' though? How is everyone doing? Yo, what's um, Gooch? Um, I might be really close to the mic, sorry, I apologize. What is your favorite part about The Fit today? Stream K-12 by Melanie Martinez. Do name Michael, he used to ride motorcycles. Okay. Well, I think they should watch the show simply because I'm in it. And that's just enough of a reason for it. This is a door, and um, I'm out. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you yes. more than any girl Go on. I have ever met mm -hmm. since I met you. Yes. I'm very glad of that. And for me, you've always had an irresistible fascination. We live in an age of ideals. And my ideal is always to marry someone of the name called Ernest. What is that? There is something in your name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a brother called Ernest. You don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. Yes, I know, it is, but personally, darling, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I don't think it suits me much at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say, I think there are lots of other much nicer names out there. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No. There is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all would be. No, the really safe name is Ernest. Once again, I must get your sins at once. I mean, we must get married at once. Married, Mr. Wedding? Well, surely. You know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed me yet. Gwendolyn, <gasps> will you marry me? Of course I will, darling! How long you've been about it, I'm afraid you've had very little practice in proposing.
15. Your guardian in particular stress on your journal as he was leaving for town yesterday. Your Uncle Chuck is so very serious. Sometimes I think he is so serious he cannot be quite well. Cecily! I'm sure. And you are see from your part about Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. I have come here for you to reform me. You might make that your mission if you don't mind. I'm afraid I've got time this afternoon. Well, if you don't mind, may I reform myself this afternoon? You could try. I will. I feel better already. You are as lovely as a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think you should talk to me like that. Miss Prism never said such things to me. Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the most beautiful girl I've ever seen, Cecily. Miss Prism says all the looks are a snare. A snare that only a sensible man would like to be called for me. Oh, Ernest! <laughs> Cecily! <laughs> Thank you. 